Why are comedians always the most fucked up people? There is no one more screwed up on the planet than a comedian. I moved to New York and, and to be honest, the first 10 years I lived in New York, I pretended I didn't have a family. I really wanted out. And then I also had like a really tough upbringing because my brother is ha has mental illness and he, as a part of our family, was really the main focus. You know, it's when you have someone in your family who needs that extra attention from your parents, it was like always what he was doing, what he was doing. And so I have these like fond memories of playing Monopoly by myself. I spent a lot of time by my, in my room by myself, kind of like trying to escape my family because it was dramatic, right? It was yeah, it's really, a lot. really hard on my parents and really hard on him, to be honest. And so I ran away to the dance studio and then I ran away. And so from a very young age, I got set in the mindset that in order to get attention and to get noticed, I had to do something really fabulous. Like I had to get straight A's. I had to be, you know, valedictorian. I had yeah. to wear a bright orange prom dress. I had to like move to New York City. Like I really, it set me up for like a lifetime of disappointment in show business, but I really have been an achiever my whole life because it was kind of the only time and no fault of my parents, but it was kind of the only time that they turned their head for a second and they were like, oh, there you are. You know, it was when- Yeah, yeah. Oh, look at you go. Yeah, you know, it was like I could come home and be like, look at my shiny thing that I've accomplished here for a minute. So, you know, I moved to New York and, and to be honest, the first 10 years I lived in New York, I pretended I didn't have a family. I really wanted out. I really wanted to just, oh. I called my parents every six months. I was not an active part of my family or my brother's life. I really just wanted to escape. I thought, you know, I put up with enough of this, I'm done. And then I realized that I really miss them. And now they're a huge part of my life. So my brother was diagnosed with Tourette's early. Oh, wow. So my brother got like a lot of like that attention too. And I was like, my parents kind of let me just do whatever I wanted. Cause I was like the, the, like the normal one. Right. Sure. I was diagnosed with uh, bipolar in my twenties. So I was like, you know, like a lot of it, like kind of all started to like make sense. I was like, I wish I had a little more attention there. So I had like that weird. Yeah. Like not official falling out with my yeah. parents, but like you kind of do. It's just like yeah. you're doing your own thing and living your own life. You don't have to say, but are you one or two? Uh, I'm two. I'm two. And then I'm type two diabetic. Oh! So I'm, I'm two'd up. Yeah. No kidding. Huh? Yeah, I'm two'd up. I'm getting my A1C checked on Friday, though. So, you know, I was in the pre diabetic range last time I went. Yep. So now let's see if I'm like, you know, I'm out of there. Why are comedians always the most fucked up people? Like, in my opinion, the comedian, I've interviewed every celebrity in the sun from Oprah to every actor to you yeah. know, every television star. There is no one more screwed up on the planet than a comedian. I think it has to do with a part of our lifestyle that's the observationalist in us. I think a lot of the times we see the negative in things, mm -hmm. right? A lot of the times we see the negative in things, but it's how do I make that funny? Because that's the way that we. You know, I can't speak for everyone, but that's a, our coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, like it, it, say like a family member died, you know, we have to break the ice at the funeral because it's like too real and too mm -hmm. sad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so we have to make a joke. I'm like, well, he never like paid his credit cards on time anyway. <laughs> you, you know, so like, you know, they're like, we would have to do stuff like that because uh, socially I always dealt with acceptance issues you know i always had friends i always had girlfriends i was I, you know my life's been good in, the, in like the normal things but i've always felt uncomfortable like am i being too quiet am i doing this but then all a lot of us too are we we do have narcissistic elements to us where it's like look at me you know and that's the trade-off when you do a live show it's like listen like you want to be entertained mm -hmm. i want to be i want my ego to be stroked let's help each other out you know, and then everyone takes care of each other. But, you know, I just think that it, the way the lens that we look through the normalities of life, you know, and we try to spin those on our heads. But a lot of the times we internalize a lot of shit we talk about. So, you know, and then a lot of the times, though, too, when we're on stage, you know, that's our trauma. If you have family members that are dealing with mental illness, don't try to, like, uh, meet them halfway. Just kind of follow them. So you kind of get to see like how they process things and how they work. A lot of people coddle people with mental illness. And I'm just like not a fan of that. It's like, you know, just because I have bipolar, like doesn't give me like car blanche should be a fucking dick. You know, so I just I, I that's why I try to tell people too, like, you, you know, you got to call people out on their bullshit, like regardless of what they're going through. It's like, you know, and there's different levels. Mm. You, know, like you could still have control over how you speak to people. You could yeah. still have control over how you handle yourself. 
But yeah. you know, like, it, it's bipolar in the entertainment business. Thankfully, they mesh kind of well. They do, and it's interesting. Like, I had a psychiatrist on our podcast one time on Lady Gang, and we were talking about that, and they're like, "No, like." In Hollywood, like 90% of the people there exhibit some sort of bipolar tendency. I mean, I feel like I have a different look at like what that really is. And I don't really love it when people are like, oh my God, that person's so bipolar. Like just because a guy's not calling you back, it doesn't mean he's bipolar. Like it's it's yeah. actually a serious thing. And it really irks me when people act like that. But the doctor said like the mania and the um, creativity that people with bipolar have, it's like it is their special gift. It comes with a slew of like shit in the backpack and baggage. But, you know, a lot of those really, really creative people and, you know, the Selena Gomez documentary just came out and it was an incredible look into her life oh, yeah. bipolar and and she's so beautiful and so famous and like dealing with that. It's an interesting thing. It really does go with Hollywood and, and can be unchecked for so long because there's like the nine to five of like your regular life does not really exist in Hollywood. So, for instance, if someone is like you and needs to sleep for six days straight after they've had something uh, you know, some sort of mania, like it's like you just call in sick for your comedy show and you're good. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there's not like this every day, like someone at the office is watching you and seeing you have this destructive behavior. Like you can really get away with having it for a long time if people are not really checking in on you. Two years ago, my therapy year, I would say was like the year of allowing myself to feel my feelings. Because if you think about it, like I left home and I was and am successful and have been able to build a career for myself. And it's like the survivor's guilt of oh, that yeah. is oh, yeah. bananas because it's like, well, you know, I, I should probably give all my money to my family. But then you're like, that actually is like the worst thing that could possibly happen to them. So yes. no, I'm not going to do that. But like come to my house in LA and versus your house is like very different situations. And like, you know, it's, there's, there's this incredible, incredible guilt of like, I got through and that somehow I, I remember deep being deeply, deeply, deeply sad in 2014. I had just gotten, I had been on TV for a few years, just gotten married, which should have been my happiest time. And I was so tired at work. They were working me like a fucking dog. I was at four o'clock in the morning. I was out on red carpets till 10 o'clock at night. I just exhausted myself being like this yes woman. And I started getting really sick. Like physically, my body was like, please stop. And like my hair fell out. I, you know, like I was just, I was really, really ill. I had a similar thing happen with my brother this uh, winter where in, in Canada, it's similar. You can't get a bed and get mental health help, which is like why my new platform is like, I'm all I'm doing is trying to change the way people are taken in, in the hospitals with oh, mental yeah. health crisis, because it's fucking insane, but you can't get to the level of like into, you know, the psych ward or whatever it is until you go through the emergency room. So you picture someone who's like in deep mania, who is maybe not left their house in four or five years, who is struggling beyond, who's scared of everything, who has crazy anxiety. We go into the ER and I instantly am like, drug him, like drug him, like knock yeah. him the fuck out because he won't stay. And I had to stay awake for three and a half days at the foot of his hospital bed. We weren't even in a fucking room. We were in the hallway on a cot and waiting for a bed to open up. And I stayed awake and I watched his little eyes because I would watch his eyes flutter. And when his eyes started to flutter, I'd call the nurse and I'd be like, more. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, like yeah. he can't exist around the, in this. Yeah, it's like Michael Myers. It's like he's yeah. like, he's, he's, he's waking up. Like, yeah, it's like, no. Bed. So when he got, admitted, you know, I'm feeling like, oh my God, this is so sad. You're here. You're in, you're in the hospital and this is so awful. And he was safe. He felt relief. Oh, he yeah. felt so thankful for these nurses and doctors. And I remember after he left, he was in for a long time. And after he left, he was like, I kind of miss it because I tell other people that all the time. When you live your life, I'm assuming in this fear and this paranoia and this anxiety, when you're actually in the place where you can't hurt yourself, nothing can hurt you. I can't imagine what weight that lifts off you. 